Detroit Rock City, back where it all began. Tiger Stadium sold out June 28, 1996. Gene, Ace, Peter, and me together again. Magic. Electricity. Here we are. We had arrived 10 days earlier, once again leaving nothing to chance, and had done seven rehearsals, including one full dress rehearsal. Ace was late for all of them. At this point in my life, there were certain perks and prerequisites I felt I had earned and were necessary to make the coming tour manageable. We booked the best hotels. I wasn't going to be staying in hotels with a paper ring around the toilet seat saying, sanitize for your protection. Ace and Peter hadn't stayed in the upper echelon hotels in the 16 years since they'd last toured with Kiss. Peter, in particular, seemed completely lacking in world experience. I took him to Starbucks one day, and he was blown away by how good a biscotti was. Quite quickly, both Peter and Ace came to resent the fact that they weren't as worldly or savvy when it came to maneuvering in nice surroundings. Peter constantly felt disrespected by hotel staff, for instance, which was simply the result of his feeling intimidated by them, and almost anyone else, for that matter. On the afternoon of the show, we did a sound check. As I stood on the stage, it was still hard to grasp that this baseball stadium would be jammed to capacity in a few hours. We took pictures, enjoying the moment. Peter, who had recently broken up with a girlfriend and was there on his own, seemed uncharacteristically open and grateful. His tendency was always to become dependent on someone and cut himself off from everybody else by using his girlfriend as a buffer, either a good buffer or a bad buffer, depending on the woman's personality. Now single, Peter let himself bask in the moment. That night, on our way to the stage, golf carts drove us through the maze-like bowels of the stadium. Suddenly, we emerged from one of the access ramps to the area behind the stage, and the air was electric. You could hear the excitement, the anticipation. It was overwhelming. I realized I was suddenly exponentially more important than I had been just a few months before, because I was again a member not just of KISS, but of this version of KISS. I could hear the pent-up feelings of the people waiting for the show. People had made the journey from around the world to witness this night. It was deafening. When the lights went down, it was pandemonium. It seemed like 40,000 flashbulbs went off as people waited for us to emerge. I knew this show was pivotal. This show would reintroduce the band and the imagery and everything that went with it. This show could allow us to move forward, to continue. It felt like we were in the eye of a hurricane, everything swirling around us as we calmly watched from the quiet of backstage. As we took the stage, still behind the curtain, I felt an incredible wave of pressure. The sound of the crowd had a tangible force to it, and even as the place went quiet, the noise of 40,000 people breathing created a deafening kind of hush. I had never felt like this before. All right, Detroit, you wanted the best, you got the best. The hottest band in the world? Kiss! The curtain dropped and the force of the crowd reaction nearly lifted me off my feet. I had to fight to be in control of the situation, of myself, of my persona, of the band. I was worried about staying connected to Peter. There was going to be a lot of foot tapping and hand signals I knew in order to keep him with us. Fortunately, he was happy to have the guidance. It wasn't like him, to be honest, to be open to that sort of thing, but for the time being, Peter was terrific, working hard, being cheerful and appreciative. The joy for me was being able to revisit something I'd experienced as a much younger person in a different frame of mind. When I was in the midst of it the first time around, I had the sense it would never end. No matter how thankful I was, I had still suspected it would be endless. Then it had died down. But there on that stage, with Kiss reunited, facing that kind of energy again, I felt thankful in an entirely different way. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about fame. I had those things already. This was the chance to read a book that I'd read as a kid, to see a movie that I'd seen when I was younger, to get something out of the experience that I hadn't had the capacity to get or appreciate before. I was overwhelmed by a sense of gratitude. As the tour continued, everyone seemed to share that feeling, at least initially. Peter swore up and down that he wouldn't repeat the mistakes he had made the first time around. And for the first few months of the reunion tour, we voted Peter the MVP. 
He often joined us for dinner. He was upbeat and pleasant to be around. His attitude seemed to mirror mine. We were incredibly fortunate to have this opportunity. One of the things we had worried about on the reunion was Peter's drum solo. He had wanted to play one from the get-go. In a perfect world, a solo was part of what we did. We had always had a drum solo during the Alive years. Looking back, it wasn't clear why we felt we needed to, but it had become a tradition. In the meantime, Peter's abilities had greatly deteriorated. But since he wanted to do it, and it was part of the tradition, Gene agreed to help him put one together. Fortunately, by the 90s, you could hit a Coke bottle with a stick and make it sound explosive and powerful if you put enough effects on it. And that's exactly what we did. We put triggers on each individual drum so when Peter hit one, it activated a pre-recorded drum sound. Although Peter had played with fire in the 70s, he was a shadow of himself now. On the reunion tour, he hit the drums like he was worried his arms would snap if he did anything more than barely tap them. His arms hurt, he said. How hard you hit the drums determined the activation of the triggers, but fortunately, they could be set to any level of sensitivity. We used to say we had the trigger set so Peter could play a solo by sneezing. I'd hear these huge drum sounds and turn around to look at Peter and see that he was barely moving his sticks. But we wanted to succeed, and succeed we did, for a time. Then came Gigi. She was a born-again Christian who by all accounts had been a dancer before, and I don't mean she was in Swan Lake. When Peter got together with her, things started to change quickly. Peter reminded me of a small animal. When it's afraid, it's timid, but when it feels protected, it shows its teeth. Peter latched onto her and started to distance himself from everyone else. I was amazed that while he and Gigi professed a deep love of God and religion, they inflicted nothing but pain and suffering on all those around them. Suddenly, when I called his room to talk, she would answer and say, What do you want? Is Peter there? What do you need him for? Just get him on the damn phone. You're a guest. She became a gatekeeper. The tour might as well have been printing money by this time. Everything was selling out and we kept adding shows. We were living an amazing life, flying around in a large private jet with a flight attendant, staying at beautiful hotels. We were on top of the world. Peter and Ace made millions of dollars, and they hadn't made squat in the nearly two decades they'd been out of the band. They had nothing before the reunion. And yet, as soon as their bank accounts began to fill up again, they changed. Peter's hotel requests necessitated Doc printing a multi-page handbook that was distributed to hotel staff wherever we went. It contained a set of complicated rules. If Peter put a sign on his door with one symbol, the staff could go in and vacuum, but they couldn't touch the windows. Another sign meant they could air the room out, but not touch the towels. He needed to be a certain distance from the elevators. He couldn't be too high up. He made them cover certain windows with tin foil. Are you kidding me? This time last year, you'd never been to a Starbucks. One afternoon, I heard screams and crashing sounds coming from the hall. I opened my hotel room door and saw Doc running past toward Peter and Gigi's room. Dishes were flying out of the room and smashing against the opposite wall in the hallway. What's wrong? What's wrong? Doc shouted. They didn't clean my room, screamed Peter. But Peter, you put your sign on the door, that means they can't come in. The cracks in the band were beginning to show already. 